name is Tyrone Cunningham. Uh, I'm the TAF Corp Relations Officer and today's webinar moderator. Uh, in a moment, we'll begin to take your questions through the chat box. So uh, I'd like to introduce our panel guest today. So today's webinar, we're excited to welcome TAF's co-founder and executive director, Trish Malines Dezico, a true visionary and leader in the public STEM education, and Dr. Heather Lechner, TAF's Executive Director in Education, who oversees our TAF Academies School Partnership Program and our Teachers and Leaders of Color Programs. And Sarah Wilkes, TAF's College Readiness Program Manager, a true TAFer, who over the course of her time at TAF has also led career programs for our students. So now you had a chance to meet some of our amaz amazing individuals that help TAF, TAF's machine run. It's time to get started with your questions. I have a question here, Trish, and I guess yourself or uh, Dr. Heather may want to take it, or you both can take it as well. Um, what is the process for a public school to bring a STEM by bring on STEM by TAF? Mm -hmm. Heather, you can take that. Oh, I was thinking you're unmuted. <laughs> I'll happily <laughs> take it. Um, we initiate the process really through relationships. As most of you know, TAF values relationships, and we want to be able to go into districts where we have potential connections to that community or to that particular district. And so we start there with the superintendent or someone who has introduced us so that we have a um, common uh, community already from the beginning beginning. Once we establish that relationship, then we begin to inquire about who might be the best school or what schools fit kind of the model of schools that we like to support. Having high level of students of color, um, persistence cha persistent challenges in test scores, um, a high level of, so, uh, of uh, students who have low socioeconomic status. Um, and so we start to look and an innovative superintendent or a really excited principal like we need someone who's willing to do the work with us. Um, so once we've identified schools that kind of fit some of those parameters, then we begin to just have conversations. We know that we can't do the really transformative work that we want to do if they don't have a good sense of who TAF is and if we don't understand the communities that we may be entering. And so there's kind of a courting period, I would say, for a few months where they get to know us and we get to know them. We introduce them to some of our other network partners because we want them to understand really like what this relationship is going to look like over the course of time. Um, because it's, it really is about a five-year relationship at least that we're looking at having. Um, we invite teachers in, we invite leaders in, and then we really ask the school community to vote. Like, do they want to move forward with us? And that's a really important question. We have a high bar of 80 to 85% expected that the staff will say, yes, we want to move forward before we become a partner. If it's less than that, we think that it's really difficult to do this work. And so um, we wait until they are assured that they want to go on this journey with us or we look for a better fit in another area. You want to add? All right, thank you. Thank you, Heather. So I guess along those same lines, and we are getting a lot of questions in, so I, I wanna put a disclaimer out there that we may not get to all of them, but we definitely appreciate those. So if you have any that we don't address, feel free to go to our website and inquire as well. Uh, but along those same lines, there's a question we have is, what is your plan to scale and expand beyond your current geographic coverage? And can you talk about the process, process of packaging and sharing your different programs with potential partners and collaborators? I'll take that one. So scaling for us is a little different um, than typical scaling in education reform of what we're used to. Um, you know, we believe you can't cause learning. That's number one. Um, and number two is we can't do our work very well if we spread ourselves too thin. Um, we made a decision when we were 20 years old um, that we would only add three um, transformation schools per year to our network because we felt that we can give them the type of partnership and the type of depth of programming and evolve the programming um, because we could give them full attention. If, if I'm uh, used to saying that if somebody gave us $10 million 
today, it doesn't mean we're going to add six schools next year. You know, we build relationships with the school community, with the district. Um, we help the school community build relationships with their own external community, and that takes time. We're not an organization that comes in with a model, plops it down and says, hey, you go ahead and run this, we'll support you a little bit, and then we're gonna hit the next five schools um, and do the same. It's really about that partnership and working together and growing together, making mistakes together and, and modeling for students together. And that just takes time. Um, I believe we will stick to our three schools where um, hopefully we'll be east of the mountains in uh, the 2022-23 20, school year. Um, and then expand over there as well as further north and south in the state. We have been asked by other states to um, think of consider coming to their state. And for us, um, our big litmus test is if we can make it east of the mountains where we can't just hop in the car down I-5 and stop in a school um, to triage, uh, then we can go anywhere at that point. What was the second half of that question, Tyrone? and sharing your different programs with potential partners and collaborators. Yeah, Can so the sharing the part, I think um, Heather covered that a little bit um, with how we share with the districts, um, but we, for our teachers of color, we also focus on um, our partnership with districts, but it starts with our partnerships with our universities. We have 10 university partners. For those of you who took the uh, Network for Edward track, you got a little lesson in that. Um, but um, it starts there and we're expanding the network for Ed work to go statewide as well. So we have to build better relationships with the colleges east of the mountains. We have Central Washington and Heritage now, but we have to continue to add there as well as a little further south and a little, a little further north. Yeah, and, and I would thank also you. add, Tyrone, um, in terms of the question around packaging, um, some of the work that TAF has been doing in the last two years is really codifying our model and um, not necessarily uh, to be prescriptive at, in the communities that we go to, mm -hmm. but so that we have a consistent practice that we are looking to um, adapt or adopt in the communities that we are going to. Um, that codification has really helped us to center equity in our work and to ensure that what we say our values are and what our mission is and what our product is that is ground in relationships, like there is an alignment there. And I think that's really important as we think about scaling and we think about moving, whether that's up and down, north or south or east. Thank you. And I guess I want to change my position here as moderator from my role uh, relating to partners, right? So we have our business partners in the community to come in and provide a valuable resource and working with our kids and bringing soft skills and collaborating and their knowledge, subject matter experts, uh, workshops, um, all of those things, right? And innovation challenges, we talk about driving questions and STEM Expo. So that, that role that our, our corporate partners and business partners is very critical to our student success in building confidence as well. So thank you. Um, so we talk about equity and representation. So the next question is, why do you think it's so hard for established institutions to truly endorse equity? Wow. <laughs> Say that one more time because that I gotta I, I gotta Sarah absorb that to one. Share. Well, yeah. you can speak on the sort of college and yeah. higher education side a little bit. Um, the because of last year's um, uprisings and, and activism, um, a lot of colleges, universities, post secondary institutions have been kind of having a reckoning over the past twelve months. And um, I think you know the short term is they've come out with lots of equity statements and formed committees and and have actually changed some of their practices in, in recruitment and and outreach. Um, but uh, you know, like any any institution, you know, changes. You know, an institution is things are institutionalized. So um, honestly, you know, the higher education system is established and historically, you know, uh, an engine of maintaining the status quo, an engine of of, of keeping those in power in power. And um, and so, 
uh, change, people have been very resistant to change. And so I think um, having a radically new idea or just embracing a radically new vision of what higher education is, how it serves the entire you know, world and the, and the entire United States equi and equitably serves uh, communities that have historically been underrepresented, underserved by these systems. Um, so it has to, there has to be an honest reckoning with, uh, in these, within these institutions, within these organizations of like, what, what are their real goals? Like, are they genuine about wanting to diversify their students or staff or, you know, faculty? Are they genuine about, you know, do they genuinely want to, uh, to make change? Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, we're in a moment now, but the proof will be down the line, I think. Thank you. Trish, you, you or Heather would like to add anything? Or? All right, thank you. Um, and we have a question. Next question is, what would you advise is the best way for other CBOs to collaborate with TAF effectively? And, and the comment, any comment is, I love what you do. So. Al. <laughs> there you go, yes, from Al. <laughs> So a lot of our collaborations are really around what students want and need. So we get back to the student voice and choice. So we have a lot of folks that have um, amazing gifts to give us in terms of um, time and talent. And um, it doesn't often always fit um, because our students make the choice on what they wanna learn. So the first thing we do is just have that conversation about what do you have to offer What's your timing? And then um, a lot of times people will contact me directly. And the first thing I'll say is, I've got to talk to the team that's working in the schools because they know everything that's going on and uh, what the schedule is and what kind of needs they have. Um, and if it matches up, it's great because then we sit down and we work it out together. We very rarely take a program whole cloth into um, our program. We like to, to make it work in the schedule with the kids, make it work so that kids have their own voice and choice in it and the teachers as well. And particularly if it's something that we wanna keep going, we have to ensure that it fits into our model. If I can jump in, I think another way to begin to think about it from an organizational standpoint, um, or a, a content area standpoint is one of the programs that we have is TSP, Teacher Scientist Partnership. And there are some very targeted tracks that are aligned with that particular program. So I see someone here who's from the medical group. Um, you know, there are ways in which we're looking at expanding. And I think if there are organizations that have a passion to partner with the school to develop young minds in whatever particular area you're, you are um, considering, then you really can bring that forth to Tyrone. And then we have some, um, some thoughts about where we want to create opportunities for students. And so that conversation can um, begin in a much more targeted way um, for, uh, that is outside of like integrated programming if that makes sense. So we have opportunities for integrated programming and opportunities for specialized programming. And Tyrone is usually a big bridge for us in that area. Thank you. Um, and these questions are pretty much going down kind of the same line. So they're pretty in depth. So the next question is, how do you engage students around critically analyzing the racial biases and anti-blackness inherent in the educational technologies? I think that um, the way I would start, oh, you wanna go, Heather? Oh, I'll, I'll take a second. Okay, so the way I was gonna start that is that we talk about the inequities across the board because they live it every day. And what we try to do is to bring in curricular content that is relevant to students, that is non-biased and get them to actually talk a lot about what's going on in their lives and what they're seeing in the world. We don't try to hide it. Um, we have um, a uh, staff member whose whole job is to take the curriculum of our district partners and align it to our pedagogy and also ensure that the curricular content is relevant to the students. Um, we had an initial conversation just to give a specific tech 
example, um, a year or two ago with AI for All. And the idea was to get um, our kids early in the game of decolonizing artificial intelligence to get them, because it's built off of data that's already there, how can we get them to help to turn that around so that it's analyzed in a way, used in a way that is equitable. So we've had a number of things like that, and then I'll turn it over to Heather for a little more um, color. Um, I guess what I would say is we we are taking um, time to figure out and really identify who needs to do the lift, right? And I think before we can expect the students to do the list, the lift in terms of interfacing um, with racial equity and bias, we have to, as an organization, as a staff, we're doing that work. The teachers that we work with, we're expecting them to do that work in partnership with us so that we can begin to change our particular practices and the environments that we're creating for students to enter. Um, with the curriculum um, development, one of our team members is actually working on what she calls a building anti-racist curriculum series. So how can teachers look at the curriculum that they're provided and unpack some of the biases that are embedded within the structures and provide an alternate way for students to access the content. So maybe the content doesn't change, but how students interface with the content changes, how teachers interface with the content changes, and then subsequently like the, the story that is told and the lessons that are learned are thereby transformed and students have the ability to and not the obligation to do that lift for us, but do that lift with us in service of them, if, if that makes sense. So we, we talked about, uh, we heard the uh, comments from the superintendent that Trish had in the event today. And we talk about alignment and, and partnerships, right? And a lot of great comments, but when we talk about getting in the new school districts or working with existing school districts. We have a question that's, that's around, what are some of the difficulties in partnering with a new school? Hmm. Um. I think that I wouldn't call it a difficulty. For every school, we um, create a new, uh, a unique experience, even though we have a framework that is consistent across all our schools. Um, we try to make it unique to each school. So we have to learn uh, the district curriculum. We have to learn their expectations, how they recruit um, teachers, how they recruit students. Um, into the various um, areas of, of um, the district. We have to look at um, the type of coach we would place in a school and that we have to, to carefully match who we're putting in there because you have to create great synergy because they're moving big boulders, big things over a period of five years and you have to have that connection there. Um, we have to get to know the surrounding community in terms of local businesses, organizations that can and, and some that do already support the school so we can have an understanding of where we can add value. Um, and then understanding the history of the school as well because we, when we work with a school, we impact everything from philosophy to culture, pedagogy, um, their content, their teacher diversity, and then their extended community. So we have to learn a lot before we get in there um, to do the work. So I wouldn't call that difficult. Where we do have difficulties is when, um, you know, what we wanna do doesn't align with district policy. In which case we sit down with the district and talk about, you know, why we wanna do the particular thing and, and how and how can we make it work while also keeping students safe and keeping them learning. Thank you. I also would say a challenge is in a system that is so focused on accountability right now, positioning teachers and students to be comfortable with the idea and structure of failure and ideation. <laughs> Right. Everybody wants to just get it right. Right. They want to know what to do to do it and get it right. And that is 100% not the process. 
And so recentering people to have that be okay is, I think, I think is a really great challenge. Um, yeah. And that's something we try to impart with our, to our students as well, that failure is part of learning, right? You don't, it's not the end of the world if your uh, science or engineering project doesn't do what, it, what you set it up to be. Like you went through the work of the research and trying and trial and error. And so um, we, we model what we, we, we practice, what we preach. So we know that uh, this COVID-19 pandemic has caused, you know, some, some challenging times, right, uh, for our students and our teachers and parents and everybody that's involved. And some of, there's maybe some silver lining in that as well and some new things that come out of it, right? Uh, so that we have time for one more question. And this question is basically, what are some of the strategies TAS instructional coaches have implemented for remaining engaged with students in the remote learning environment? I can give a few examples of how staff in general have have uh, have adapted to the remote environment and kind of taken the best advantage they can. Um, so a big emphasis this year, as we went 100% remote, is to really um, emphasize community building and community maintenance, sense of community maintenance and sense of belonging, because it's very hard for students um, who, even those who already have a strong identity with um, with TAF at Sahali, that you know some of whom you got to meet during our videos today. Um, it's hard to maintain that remotely. And um, so our, our teachers have been very focused, all our staff have been very focused in our professional development for our teachers have been uh, centered a lot on, on uh, social emotional learning and um, building that community. So our, you know, our, our, our uh, Zoom classes always start with some kind of icebreaker. There's, there's, we have a week, uh, we have a daily half hour session called Wolf Pack Time. Our, our uh, mascot at Tafetsahale is the wolf. Um, where the students are doing kind of interactive things. So, um, you know, they have to take online online kind of quizzes or, or share something on their screen or share something about themselves. Um, I've seen uh, some teachers have uh, in, 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 uh, invite students to create their own Spotify lists that then get shared with the, with the whole class. So there's a sense of um, community being built through the um, uh, online system. And then um, one advantage with, with remote learning or just the norm of remote learning that was kind of unexpected but has been really great is we've been able to get a lot of um, classroom guests that we otherwise probably wouldn't have. So we've had some scientists, engineers from all over the country visit our classes who would never have, you know, made the flight out to Seattle. Um, and then even just more locally, you know, getting folks in Seattle or North, North King County, you know, we're, we're down in South King County to be able to just, you know, not worry about traffic and and come right over. Um, this year, I and my team uh, had our first 100% remote college and career fair. Um, I was actually able to get more. Usually, it's in the gym and it's your you know your classic college fair with the tables and and representatives from different schools. And usually, it's been more kind of local um, uh, local Washington State, Western Washington schools. This year, I had over 50 colleges and universities, including three HBCUs, two Ivy Leagues, um, as far west as University of Hawaii, as far east as Bates College up in Maine. Um, so from all over, and it's it's because of that online uh, platform that we've been able to actually get our kids more connected in a way with with the lar with the wider world. So that's yeah. been pretty exciting. Yeah, and I'll add from a part again from a partnership standpoint, you know, this work from home environment has allowed. Uh, employees of our corporate partners that are located all around the world to participate in, in our sessions and our presentations to those uh, partners. So that has kind of the silver lining to be able to access to those additional resources. Um, so Trish, I guess I want to hand it over to you for, for a last comment and then I'll end with uh, to our uh, guest. Well, first of all, thank you all for taking your time. Um, to join us. I know that everybody has busy lives and the fact that you chose to not only spend time to watch the luncheon and participate in the luncheon, but to also come to this Q&A, um, that re really means the world to us. Um, having partners like you, having supporters, friends really makes a difference for us. Um, and uh, this time last year, um, or this is the time that our team is, is starting to look at um, how we plan for the next school year. And it's an exciting time because we get a chance to kind of dream wildly 
and think about all the great things that we can do for um, our students and our teachers. And, um, you know, I, I think our team is going to design some really amazing programs for both remote and in person. But um, I think I can speak for everybody when I say we want everybody back in schools, back in their classrooms, to be with their friends, to be with their teachers. But we'll be ready no matter what. Um, and I, I, we hope that you continue uh, to find ways to stay involved with TAF, to be a, a part of Team TAF uh, while we grow. And um, remember to spread the word that it takes all of us to make this happen. So thank you, and I hope you all have a wonderful, wonderful day. It's yours, Tyrone. Thank you, Trish. I, I'm just going to repeat what I heard one of our teachers say, and it was, um, it was presence over perfection. You know, you don't have to be perfect all the time, but be present. So with that, I'll just I'll end. And again, appreciate everyone joining us today. Uh, our event will be up online on YouTube. Feel free to share it and go back and look at another track as you're interested. And we have information on our website. Uh, and thank you for being here and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Take care.